بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم و بهی نستعین ثم الصلاة والسلام على سیدنا و نبینا ابی القاسم المصطفى محمد و على آله الطیبین الطاهرین Dear sisters and brothers, salam alaykum. I hope that you are all keeping well and I hope you are ready for, inshallah, the most interesting lecture so far. I mean, not of all the lectures in the world, I mean just like in the past few nights. Inshallah, tonight is going to be a little bit more towards the solution. The first few nights we're giving introduction diagnosis of what's wrong, inshallah today we'll go deeper into finding a solution. But before that, I want, if you agree, I have a suggestion. We have so many younger people with us and it's such an amazing thing. So I thought if you agree, let's join together and recite the salawat for every person here and also watching at home who is less than 18 years old either the teenagers or younger ones. It's so beautiful and amazing that you guys are with us. I'm so grateful that you came and love you so much. So let's join and recite the salawat for all of them. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajil farajahum. There's a young Zainab at home watching as well. And in the videos she's seeing, she, you know, cause this speaker is blocking my legs and she thinks these are my legs. So she's been asking her mom, why are Sheikh's legs so massive? So bless you, Zainab. Actually, yeah, it's just I've been eating a lot. So, but these are not my real legs. These, these are the sofa. So um, if you remember the first night, I was saying that one of the reasons life doesn't make sense, one of the reason we have lost a kind of touch with reality we have so many questions in our life, we have difficulties, and sometimes we feel like life is not worth it. Whereas one of you sent me a message and said, what's the point of life? I said the reason why we have this issue is that we need a narrative that can make sense of our life. A kind of narrative, a story in which we can live in and understand our past, our present moment, and imagine a future. And without a narrative that can explain to us what on earth are we doing on earth, life becomes just a series of disconnected moments. You're just stuck right now with whatever you have. If right now your life is full of pain, then life becomes miserable. You're disconnected from the past and the future. So that's what we said we need, a kind of narrative. Then we said, okay, fair enough. Doesn't religion provide a narrative? Religion gives a narrative. What does it say? At least now we're talking about Islam, for example. Okay, it says you have a past, you were created. For example, in the story of Adam, that's how the beginning of humanity. Then you came to this world and you're gonna be here for, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years and you're going to be tested here. So whatever you do, it's a test. And then after you die, another thing starts called Akhira. So this world is dunya according to this narrative. And then after this dunya finishes, you're going to go to another world. That one is called Akhira. And if you were a good boy, you're going to get reward. And if you were naughty or you did bad things, you're going to get punished. And so, this was the, the religious narrative that was meant to give us the ability to make sense of our life. Now the problem with this narrative is that it's slowly, slowly losing its power to convince us. And there are many numbers of reasons for this. One of them is that we have so many questions from narrative, and by the way, when I say we, I don't mean every single person, right? Obviously, I'm generalizing. So many people have questions about this narrative. Okay, fair enough, for example, it's a test. Why is there so much pain in it? Why do little children need to go through cancer? How is a test for them? 
Why do couples who've recently found love and found each other, suddenly one of them has to get a terminal illness and die? This seems to be, even if it's a test, it's a very cruel test. Why is it designed this way? If the whole purpose of this 60, 70, 80 years is so that God knows if I'm a good person or bad, if it's a test, well, can't you test me with other things? Don't they always say that there are some people who are tested, for example, with their wealth, with good things that happen to them? Well, can't we all be tested like that? Why some of the tests have to be so painful? Couldn't God create another test in which there's less pain, which we just cannot fathom why it's happening? That's one of the questions. Another question, how is this narrative making sense of all the things we have to do, the rituals? They say in these 60, 70 years that you're here, you have to pray, you have to, for example, fast, or well, some say you have to, for example, I don't know, do this, do that. You have to have beard, you have to have hijab, you have to do this, you have to do that. You have to pay money here, you have to do that. I'm doing all of this, why? The narrative may say, well, if you don't do these, then once you go to that other world, you're going to be messed up. It's going to bad things going to happen to you. Pray so that when you go, for example, to the other world, you'll go to the good place. Oh, why should I do this? Because of that. So a lot of the things that we are doing right now, and it asks so much of us, the narrative, it's not like it just tells a story. It actually asks certain things from you. So see if you want to believe in this narrative that this is the story of humanity. You come to this world for a test, and then afterwards it's going to make sense. You also have to do certain things. For example, you have to pray this and that. And when will you see the result of all of this? After you die. So between what you have to do and the time at which you see the result of it, there's so much time. There's so much gap. And you can see right now, because at the same time we're living in a place in which we are not the only group, we're actually a minority. So we can look at other people with different narratives other than Islam or even other than religion and see a, they're not doing the rituals we're doing. They're not praying, they're not fasting, they're not doing all of that, and their life doesn't seem to be that different. It's not like as a result of our prayer, we're so different to them. No, they're having a very similar life to us. So we have, again, another question. Why is this narrative asking me to do things which don't really change me that much? And another question that this narrative may not be able to explain for some people is that, okay, fair enough, at some point this will finish, I go either to the good place or, or the bad place, but what about now? Especially for those who are going through a very difficult time, sometimes making the day end is difficult. Although if you've been through depression, if you've been through serious anxiety, sometimes you know that even going through one hour is a very difficult task. So are you telling me that I have to drag this pain for 50, 60 years till one day this, do this world would finish? I'm stuck with my pain for 60, 70 years? So that's another question we might have from this narrative. At the same time that we have questions from the narrative, we also have doubts about it. And... Part of this doubt has to do with, for example, the way it tries to explain what happens after we die. So then there are so many details in this narrative about what happens when they put you in the grave. Right now, in the same city that we are, there are a lot of people who believe in another narrative. They think as soon as you die, that's it, the end of your life. You may, it's like you fall into sleep and afterwards there's nothing. Or they even say, you're not even there when death happens. That's the narrative a lot of people believe in. And so as a result of being next to a lot of people who, who really seriously believe in that, some of us may start doubting it too. Be like, okay, I, I believe in it. Like in my head, I've memorized it. I've been to Sunday school. I've got it. But sometimes in my heart, it's losing its power on me. So some of us may even start experiencing doubts. Really? There's another life after this? Like grandma is somewhere right now, and, and like she's living. So we may have these doubts as well, and sometimes the details which are in the narrative doesn't help 
with the doubts we have. So, for example, Salan, they say that when they put you in the grave, there could be punishment in the grave. So one of them is they say the grave may be tight. And for many hundreds of years, people believed in that. And as a result of that, they believed in that narrative. If I live a bad life, when they put me in the grave, I'm going to suffer in the grave, and the grave is going to be tight. And then there are these entities that come and ask me questions in the grave. So I have to be careful. But then you see that now, increasingly, a lot of people are doubting that. They're like, okay, we can actually, we have the technology to look into the graves and see if they get tighter or not. If the narrative remains at a superficial level, and we think it's this physical grave that's going to get tighter, well, isn't it so easy to check right now? All we need is to check and see if these graves are getting any tighter or not. And even previously, there were people who had their issues and questions about the superficial level of this narrative. Like, from even before these days of technology, there were those who would put, for example, flour in the mouth of one of their, like, people who passed away, and then they would check a few days later and see if the flower is still in their mouth. That means, oh, no one asked them the questions. Because if anyone asked them the questions, for example, what's your religion, they would open their mouth and the flower would come out. So I'm saying that from a long time ago, people have had these doubts about the superficial nature of this narrative. And the problem with doubts and questions is that the more doubts and questions you have about a narrative, it loses its grip on you. It loses the power to convince you at the level of your heart. And as it loses the power to convince you, it also loses the power to give meaning to your life. It stops helping you make sense of your life. And so when you're going through that difficulty, when that illness comes or when that serious challenge in your life comes, you are no longer able to get help from the narrative to sustain yourself and to make sense of what is happening to you. Because as soon as you want to do that, all the different places, all the different holes in the narrative manifest to you. So, okay, this challenge, one day it will make sense. And like, yeah, who said that's even going to happen? Ooh, what if these people who don't believe in God or half their life, they're right? The more you have questions, the more you have doubts, the less powerful the narrative would be. The less it will help you make sense of your life. And so it will, even if you believe in it, because unfortunately one of the things we, we have made a mistake with is that we think you can force yourself to accept a narrative. Mr. Dan, I feel like if I go to a theology class, if I keep listening to a lecture, I can convince myself that there is a life after this death. But it's not that, that's not how it works. All you can do is put some sentences in your mind. Your heart can never be forced. La ikran hafeddin. Your heart cannot be forced. Your heart has to accept the narrative. And as long as your heart has not accepted the narrative, it will never work on it. So what I'm trying to do, inshallah, from tonight onwards, is to show you that if we want to have a narrative that can convince our heart that we can make sense of what we're doing in this world, we can make sense of the future that's awaiting us, we need to go deeper in religion, and we need to have a deeper understanding of the religious narrative. Please recite the salawat. Is it okay if we stand up and come a little bit forward so that the people who are coming can, can have a seat? I'm, I'm very sorry. If you could just maybe come a little bit forward so that we can make room for the people who are... And to the right as well, if it's okay. Front and right. I really apologize because the door is at the left. So if we could try and fill the room from the right... Oh, it's their left. See, everything is very interesting. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for doing that, by the way. I really apologize. Right now, with my leg, I really know how difficult it is to get up, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much, and I apologize that we had to do that. But, inshallah, this would give more room for our other beautiful brothers who can come and be with us, inshallah. 
So we said we need to go deeper now and try and find, and I'm not saying let's let go of the religious narrative. That's obviously not what I'm doing. Otherwise, I wouldn't really be a sheikh and they wouldn't invite me here anymore, right? I'm saying this narrative has the power to go deeper in it and then it would start making more sense. And I would, inshallah, even try to show you that the deeper we go, the more loyal we are to the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt. Because actually that's what they've expected from us the whole time. See, right now, even, it's another issue we have with the previous narrative, is that many of us who are living in a world which everything around us, and most of the things around us, have happened through science from this technology, the camera, the microphone, so many things. Sometimes we feel in order to be loyal to the narrative, we need to let go of our scientific mind or rational mind because perhaps part of the narrative do not match with that. So in another way, we're also torn apart between the reality of our life, which is we're living in a world, most of which is made through science, and some details of our narrative which may not go well with it. So it's like, again, you're torn apart. But I'm saying as we go deep, we'll see that no, actually, the religious narrative, the Islamic narrative is one that does not need any incongruence with the scientific worldview. In fact, it's so much, it, it, it can in integrate with that and it actually take it much deeper. Okay, in order to start this, to find the actual deeper religious narrative, let's refer to Surah Rum in the Quran, verse number seven. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا This is the first part of the verse. And they only know the surface level of the life of this world. Allama Taba Taba in Tafsir al-Almizan, when he reaches this place, he asks a question. He says, when someone tells you, you only know the surface, the ظاهر of something, what do you expect the rest of the sentence to be? Like if I tell you, you only know me at a surface level. What do you expect the next sentence to be? You don't know my depth, right? If I say you only know my surface, that means you don't know my depth. So Allah says, okay, the verse says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا They only know the surface of this life, the ظاهر. So you expect it to say, they don't know the bottom of this dunya. But the verse says something else. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ it doesn't say they don't know the bottom of dunya. It says they don't know akhira. And Allah uses this to say, see, akhira is nothing but the bottom of dunya. We, at the superficial level, we thought that it is dunya, dunya finishes, and at the end of dunya, akhira starts. But it seems like Quran is telling us no. Akhira is always there. Akhira is already here. And now, let me remind you of what Imam Hussein said to Muhammad Hanafi. Imagine this is towards the end of Imam Hussein's life. He wants to share one of the deepest wisdoms that has been left with us. What does he say? It's as if dunya never was and Akhira was always there. Lam Tazal, it never stopped being there. So what I'm trying to say is that when you go to the deep, to the depth of Quran and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, you realize that Akhira doesn't start later on. Akhira is already here. Now, you may be asking, okay, what about all those verses in the Quran that, for example, say at the end of this dunya, the time will come that, for example, this will happen to the mountains, this would happen to the skies. Khub, it's saying that Akhira is then, once at a certain time, at a future. No, I'm saying that's not the deep understanding of those verses. And let's look at the Quran and find out. Let's go to Surah Naba, verse 20. Right? So, Yeratil Jebalu Fakanat Saraba. One of the verses in which Quran is explaining what is going to happen at that later point, at that future point that we all think Akhira starts from then. 
Quran says at that point the, the mountains so yirat. Allah, some translate that they will be moved, some translate that it would be removed, it, they would be vanished. But the next of the verse is so interesting. Fakanat saraba. It doesn't say fasarat saraba. It doesn't say they become like a mirage. It says they were always a mirage. What does that mean? Quran is saying all the things that happen at that later point that we used to think Akhirah starts there, all of them have already happened. It's just that we can't see them. A time will come when we start seeing them. In other words, Akhirah doesn't happen at that point. Akhirah is already here. At that point, we start seeing it. Okay? Now, let me give you another example to make sense of this. Imagine you're in a room, and you want to see the sky. What can you do? You have to leave the room to see the sky. Does that mean the sky wasn't there before you left the room? No. The sky was always there. It's just that as long as you were in the room, you couldn't see the sky. The sky is not created when you leave the room. No. So in the same way, Akhirah is not going to be created later on. Akhirah is already here. It's just that right now, we are in a kind of environment that we can't see it. But like in that room, there are other ways. You don't need to leave it to be able to see the sky. What other options you have? You can remove the ceiling. Or maybe part of the ceiling, you can put a window ceiling, a glass ceiling. And even in the room, you can see the sky. Which is what the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet told us. That even in this world, you can see Akhirah. You don't need to wait for that point. You don't need to die to see it. Do you remember when we were reading Khutbah Muttaqin or Khutbah Hammam of Imam Ali alayhi salam, what he said? He said, وَهُمْ وَالْجَنَّتِكَ مَنْ قَدْ رَآهَ The situation of the pious people, again, piety, not surface level, not the one who prays, etc. No, real levels. هُمْ وَالْجَنَّتِكَ مَنْ قَدْ رَآهَ Their situation is such that even in this world, it's as if they're seeing heaven. Is it just that they are seeing heaven? No. They're already enjoying the blessings of heaven. So Imam Ali is clearly saying, Akhirah is accessible right now. You don't need to leave the room to see the sky. You can be inside the room and remove the ceiling. You can be in this world and see Akhirah. Which is what again Imam Hussein said. dunya lam takun wal lam tazal. You can reach a place in which you see more of Akhira here than you can see dunya. Please recite the salawat. Okay. We're going to come back to this, inshallah, again tomorrow night. Now let's talk about this idea that what is stopping us from seeing this? If we're saying Akhirah is accessible right now, and not only it's accessible, in some of the ahadith, the imam is actually saying not just accessible, but come on, access it. It's as if they expect every single person to get there. So there's even a hadith by the prophet in which he says, if you just live correctly, you will see every single thing I'm seeing. Do you remember all those hadiths that, for example, if you eat the wealth of an orphan, it's as if you're eating fire. That means at that very moment, something is happening. It's not like later on. No, 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 at that very moment. And the Prophet said, if you live in a certain way, you can see it right now too. Oh, no, by the way, it's not actually fire. Or fire is metaphor. We'll talk about that. Okay, so what is this ceiling? What is this thing inside this world that's stopping us from seeing Akhira, from seeing its depth? I'm saying that thing is inside us. It's not an external thing. It's not like someone has, you know, tried to block us. No, we have an inner veil, which the Quran says as well. What does Quran say? There's nothing wrong with the world. No, it's just we've got veils right now, which stop us from seeing the world. And this veil, again, is not a physical thing. It's just the way 
we have made ourselves the way we've done, and we'll talk about that. In order to get there, I need to talk about something. And so please keep all of this here that we're trying to show that Akhirah is not created later on. Akhirah is right now here. This world is not dunya. Masan, all those things they said about hope of dunya is not hope of this world. Dunya is a way of being in this world. Dunya is the surface of this world. This world also includes Akhirah. Hope. We're trying to show you that in order to get there, I need to talk about something. What is this thing inside us that blocks us from seeing that? See, there is an infinite amount of information even in this small hall. In every, and, and imagine how much there is in the world. And if we wanted to include all of that in order to, to see, we could not even function. Let me show you how much information there is right now in this very room. And if you wanted to keep all of that in your mind, you, could, you would literally stop in your place. You wouldn't be able to do anything. See, right now, what are you looking at? Well, most of you, I'm hoping you're looking at me. And so out of all the people in this room, and every single person here, there's so much information about them, right? So and their hairstyle or their scarf or what are they wearing, what color it is, how are they sitting, how tall they are. There's so much information about you have ignored all of that. Out of all the people here, you're just looking at me. And now I want to ask you, could you look at everyone and still focus on what I'm saying? No, that's impossible. We don't have that capacity. The information, even in this one small room, is so infinite that if we want to function, we need a system, a cognitive system, that narrows it down for us. Right? And I'm, seeing, I'm telling you that you're not even seeing me. Most of your attention right now is being paid to my words. Why? Because there's a, there's a machinery inside you that based on what you are trying to achieve, right now, what are you trying to achieve? You are people listening to a lecture. So that's what you are. That's the agent arena. As an agent, you're a listener, and the arena is a lecture hall. So because that's what you want to achieve, you're only focusing on my words, maybe some surface of my face. But imagine if there was another person in our, in, amongst us. So we had an artist who, for example, Shabab Septin had told someone today, you don't listen, you try to draw a portrait of the sheikh. The agent arena relationship would change. That person no longer needed to understand my, what I'm saying. What they needed to do was to draw me. As soon as that changes, the way they look at the world changes. And so my words would fade from their world. Some other features of me would show to them, right? So maybe, for example, the angles of my eyebrow. Those, have, those who have done portraits, they know how much detail is just in one face, right? The way, for example, the eyes finish and then the nose starts. Okay, the nose, what angle does it have? What light shades are on my face? Maybe it's like a warm red shade. Where do the shades finish and the lighter parts start? Do you know how much detail there's in my face you're not seeing right now? Because that's not relevant to you. What's relevant to you is to understand the lecture. So there's a cognitive machinery inside you that fades all of that irrelevant information away from you. In the month of Ramadan, what we spoke about was what's inside you gives a taste to the world. Now I'm taking that deeper. I'm saying what's inside you not only gives a taste to the world, but it removes so much of it away from you so that you can focus on that little tiny bit of information which is relevant to what you're trying to achieve. And literally all of the people in this room are completely out of your world right now. Unless you decide to pay attention to another person, and then the rest of us will fade from your view. This thing, the part of the world that manifests itself to you, this is what we call that object or that part of the world, they say it becomes salient to you. Please pay attention to this word because now we're going to keep using it a lot, right? So the part of any environment that you need to look to see based on the inner goal you have, 
That part becomes salient to you, becomes visible. Everything else fades, right? And what is salient for you could be different to what's salient for other people. So an example I, showed, I used to make this clear is imagine you're sitting in a wedding, you're at a table with four different people, right? They're all in the same hall, but every single one of them is going to see a different thing. Oh, try this thing. I don't try to remember a certain situation like that. See, based on what is inside them, they'll see different things. And they will literally not see other things. Masana, maybe one of them wants to buy a purse. So in the wedding, all she's looking at, oh, Masana, look at Maryam's purse. See, purses, because she wants to buy a purse, all the purses become salient. What do I mean by salient? When she looks at the world, these purses jump and grab her attention. Look at me. Everything else fades. You literally don't see it. Now, another person who may be, for example, insecure about her height is checking everyone's height. Ooh, Sora is so tall. That must be at least five feet eight. But no, 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 she's got heels, right? For her, maybe she has some inner insecurities. Height becomes salient. And if they go home and they're talking to each other, they're like, did you check Maryam's purse? No, no. What purse was she? What purse did she have? Maryam's purse. Asan, she didn't even see it. In the same way that this one didn't see Sarah's height. They were in the same hole, but because there's so much information, your brain only shows you that part of the world that's relevant to you. Now, please recite the salawat. Oh, this is, by the way, not something bad. As you saw, this is our brain's way of making sure we don't waste too much time. It says, this is what you want to achieve. I'll remove all the irrelevant information. You want to buy a car. What do you care what other people are wearing? When you're in the car I'll only, and you're driving, I'll only bring the cars to your attention. Have you seen it? Masala, you want to buy a Toyota and you're driving, or Masala, you want to buy a Honda. And you're like, eh, you start seeing Hondas everywhere. Another person who wants to buy a Jaguar, for example, they see Jaguars everywhere. It's not like as soon as you make that decision, angels come and put more Jaguars in the world. No, Jaguars become relevant to you, and you have this inner cognitive machinery of relevance realization, which only makes relevant information in the world salient to you. It's perfect. It's helping you. Now, the problem with this is that it can be abused by culture, by others, and it can also become pathologized. Oh, see, why did we have this inside us? The reason we had this inside us was that it would help us do the thing that we want to do. Masalan, you here want to listen to the lecture and inshallah, masalan, have a deeper understanding of your religion. That's what you wanted to achieve. And it said, I'm going to show, and I want to make something salient that's relevant to that goal. Perfect. So we have this inner idea that whatever is salient to me, it's important. Because our whole life, the things which we cared about became salient. Once you fall in love with someone, they're always salient. You're always thinking about them. So we have this inner shortcut that whatever is salient, whatever keeps coming to our attention, whatever we keep seeing must be important, must be relevant. And that's a very true. I said, and look at most, which people come to your mind more often. Your children, your mother, your family, and these are the important people in your life. You don't suddenly start thinking of, I don't know, the neighbor 10 doors, no. So usually what's salient, it's also what's important. The people you keep thinking about are the important people in your life. Now, the problem is that this can be abused. For example, one of the techniques in advertising is that we will try to make something that's not important to you salient to you so that you think it's important. How do I do that? We keep showing it to you. You're driving, we put a billboard there. You're watching a TV series, we'll put an ad there. You're on your phone, we'll put an ad there. We'll show this thing so many times to you so that your brain gets tricked. Because it's seeing it everywhere, it becomes salient and it thinks it's important. 
So you really think like, no, it's so important to have this watch. See, they abused our inner system. An inner system which removed the irrelevant parts of the world so that we can focus on what's important for us can be abused by others to make us think something that's not important is important by keep bombarding it, keep showing us. Another way, for example, this could be misguided is imagine if you're living in a culture in which whoever successful people you listen to, it's only talking about financial success. All the successful people are the ones with more money. It's all about success at work. It's all about getting that promotion. It's all about increasing that salary, six figure, seven figure. What happens in a culture, only financial success becomes salient. And we already have this inner cognitive machinery that thinks that salient things are important. So we may end up thinking that, oh, only financial success is important. See, culture tricked us. Even though that's not the case, family is important to us as well. Other types of spiritual success, physical success, these are important to us as well. It's just that maybe in one culture, they don't become salient. So as you can see, our salient machinery this relevance realization machinery we have can become pathologized. Now, this is why also religion, in order to protect us, gave us some guidelines, which again, we are taking them at such a superficial level. Do you know what, for example, the Ahl al-Bayt said, in every setting, whenever you gather, try to remember us? What are they trying to do? They're saying, make us salient to yourself so that you realize we are important. Or, for example, that hadith that says when you want to have friends, make sure among your friends there are people who remind you of God. Why? Because if you don't have friends that remind you of God, God will never become salient to you. And whatever is not salient, it loses its importance. So, see, religion had these ideas of how to help you with your relevance realization machinery. By trying to help you design your life in such a way that important things become salient. God becomes salient. What is one of the reasons Imam Hussein has helped us so much? Every year, at least for a few nights, it makes religion salient to us. Imagine how difficult it is in the rest of the year to try and sit down and spend one hour for 10 nights to think about important things. It's so difficult because it's not salient. What is salient? Netflix is salient. What is salient? Instagram reels. By the way, I'm not saying those things are bad. Everything has its place, right? But I'm saying it's so difficult for us to make important things salient for us. This is very important. We do not have full control over this machinery. You cannot decide what, we, what becomes salient for you. You can participate in the process, you know? So that's all later on, inshallah, towards the end, we speak about this idea that if a person wants to remind God and remind the spiritual importance of life, they can't just decide that. No, we need to design life in such a way that we have an ecology of practices, a term I'm borrowing. We have an ecology of practices, technologies, things that we have set in our life that anchor us and make the important things salient to us again. In the same way that, for example, Muharram of Imam Hussein is doing that for us. And if we didn't have this, believe me, it would have been impossible to get this number of people for 10 nights to pay attention to religion. Okay, so we do not have full control over the machinery that brings certain parts of the world to our attention and leaves certain parts of it out. Okay, what is the relevance between all of this and the discussion we had in the beginning of the session? Which is, dunya is the vahir, akhira is the batin, and akhira is available right now. The link between these two is this. Dunya has become so salient for us that Akhira has faded away from our attention. Akhira, we can't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. 
In the same way that maybe most of you tonight didn't look at that, for example, we have that beautiful banner there that says, Mokab Shabab Septa. It was here. Wallah, it was here all this time. It wasn't just created now. But Alan, look at it. You just saw it now. Why? Because you were paying attention here. So I'm saying, Akhirah, it's here right now. It's just that dunya is so salient in the same way that because I'm shouting and I've got the speaker and microphone, I'm so salient that maybe you're not looking at that banner or the person next to you. Akhirah is present right now. Dunya is not this world. Dunya is the surface of this world. And I'm going to give one example and finish for tonight. We'll continue this discussion tomorrow. How could it be that two things, Akhira and dunya, are available in the same place? Well, let me give you an example. As a child, we had a certain way of being oriented towards the world. Certain things were salient to us. But as we grew up and we became an adult, we were reoriented. The framing which we, we look at the world was changed. And so if you're an adult and still candy and toy is salient to you, like for example, you're walking in Asda and all you're seeing is, for example, the candies and toys, everyone will be like, something's wrong with you. You still haven't grown up, right? A child and an adult can walk in the same grocery store in Asda Sainsbury's, but they will see different things. Candy toy becomes salient to the child and to the adult, what is it? Oh, I need to buy a lamp, the lamp died, I need toilet paper. I need to buy a thingy to wash dishes. The child and the adult are in the same place, but they're seeing different things. Even at home, the child wants candies, wants to play. What does the adult see? What does the adult look at the world and become salient to them? You tell me, what's salient to you right now? In the, for example, if you're in your 80s, 90s, 20s, oh, independence. I want to leave home. I want to live independently. Maybe I can get a room in the dorm. Finally get away from my parents. Later on, you're like, oh, I'm going to get this job. Job becomes salient to you. Later on, promotion becomes salient to you. But do you think a child looks at the world and can see promotion? They don't even know what it is. They can't see it. You and your child are in the same world, but you see so much more. And that's why they say, what is the child to the adult? The adult is to the sage. In the same way that when we grow up from a child to an adult, we start seeing so much more. Success, promotion, relationships, romantic love. As we start our spiritual growth, we start seeing much more, so much more that all the things that as an adult we used to see are only considered the surface. And that's what dunya is. And inshallah we'll talk tomorrow about how we can start going deeper. Tonight inshallah, tonight is the night of Umm al -Banin. And I ask every single one of you inshallah to bring your heart Try and get yourself to a place where, inshallah, we can all benefit from the masa'ib by the beautiful voice of our beautiful reciter, Mullah Nuruddin al-Kazimi. Please recite the salawat and then we will, inshallah, enjoy the masa'ib. <laughs>